this forum, we are entitling it uh, Happy, the Happy Place. The Happy Place is an online forum where we address serious issues affecting people of all ages and status. Why the Happy Place? It is because a key strategy in managing mental health issues is through participating in activities which give us joy. Some of the activities that we can participate in so that they give us joy include exercising, being kind to others and also to self, eating great balanced meals, spending time outdoors, enjoying adequate sleep, listening to music, spending time to be with loved ones, even having time uh, for a laugh and meditating on God's word. When we engage in activities which make us happy, feel good hormones are released into our brains that are suppressing feelings of sadness. Happiness is so important in managing mental health issues such that there is a recommendation to the, by the government of Kenya to establish a mental wellness and happiness commission. One of the ways of being kind to others is helping them resolve their issues. It is for this reason that the series of webinars based on holistic approach have, have, been, have been organized. Today's webinar is the third one. The first webinar was on rescuing teens and preteens from drug abuse. The second one was on demystifying mental illnesses. Kindly sub subscribe to my YouTube channel. That is the name of the channel is Dr. Rebecca Wambua so that you can be receiving notifications of new wholesome content when I post. Since this is a joint venture, we would be most pleased if you indicated on the chat specific topics which you would like us to address in forthcoming webinars. Remember, we normally source for experts in areas or topics that we are discussing. So we welcome you to the happy place. I am your host, Dr. Rebecca Wambua, with 18 years of teaching experience at the school level and 14 years of teaching experience at the university level. So welcome everyone. It's a pleasure for you, for, for, for us. It's a pleasure that you've been able to join this forum. And as we start, I'd like to request Wairimo to lead us in prayer. Wairimo, are you there? is here. Okay, you can lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you this evening. We want to thank you for your grace. We thank you for mm -hmm. all that are gathered here and the ones that are going to join us. We pray that you be with us, you guide us, and take care of us. We pray that you continue improving our mental health so that we can be able to go on with our lives. We pray this trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Wairimo, for that prayer. Amen. Amen. So just a reminder of the rules that uh, we'll follow so that we are able uh, to have a very effective session. So unless you're talking or you have an opportunity to talk, ensure your mic is off and also your camera is off. But when you are presenting, ensure that the mic is on and the camera is on. Uh, the other thing, we are going to have a number of presenters. So we have back-to-back -back presentations of 10 minutes each. And at the end of all the presentations, uh, we'll be able to ask questions. So if you have a question as presentations are going on, uh, please write the question on the chat or note it somewhere such that after the presentation, uh, we'll be able to answer your question. So we thank God that you've been able to join us and we are now going to begin our session. Uh, our first presenter is Elizabeth. Our first presenter is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Wanjugu Karanja. She's yes, going to present... She's going to present on causes of trauma, 
She, she is a Kenya registered psychiatric nurse at Matharian National Teaching and Referral Hospital. So she's going to present, uh, uh, she's going to share her PowerPoint presentation on causes of trauma. So welcome and begin sharing. You have 10 minutes now. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, yes, I am Melissa Dikarate, as you know. I'm supposed to take you through the causes of trauma uh, in mental health. Okay. So there are several of them, but the following are the ones which I'm able to come up with. And we start with the natural disasters. These are unexpected and undesirable situations. All events that occurs and cannot be controlled by human. Uh, <clears throat> okay, sorry, sorry. So uh, people become distra distracted and these uh, natural occurrences, they can cause loss of, li of lives and a lot of uh, a lot of disabilities or distractions which which may lead to uh, to traumas this may include floods earthquakes and the strong waves that are caused by volcanic eruptions under the sea these are all uh, happenings that cannot be controlled by anybody and they can cause trauma in the future we also talk of violence with violence, this may include uh, the, the domestic violence that leads to the function of families or homes. And uh, this is most occurring in our day-to-day -day setup. We have experienced gender-based violence, which also may lead to single parenthood, which again becomes very hard for a single parent to be able even to raise the young ones and bring a lot of problems that in the future, it leads to a lot of trauma that may lead to mental illness. We also come uh, across school uh, violence or bullying, which we experience in schools. Uh, though nowadays, they, it's like they, they are taking care of them, but still there are some uh, schools that uh, they are still going on. And uh, this causes low self-esteem to our young ones. And if not uh, attended to, sometimes it may spill to adulthood, whereby somebody feels that you are unworthiness. There is hopelessness in life. You are not able to do what you are supposed to do because you feel that you are not in a importance. Again, we, it causes loneliness and isolation whereby a person is not able to interact with the rest of people. You don't also want to, to be together with others. You feel that you, you need to stay alone. It, also may, it might also cause depression and anxiety. Uh, and again, these are now our, uh, the conditions that we experience in, in mental health, mental illness. Loss of uh, a loved one. This lands deep and uh, it causes a lot of depression and especially to if, if, if the, the one who has, been, uh, who has passed on is the breadwinner, uh, remember, and especially in childhood, you, you, are, you rely on them solely. So uh, with, with the, the loss, they experience a lot of difficulties in life, they are not also able to, to get what they were supposed, what they usually get or what they are supposed to get because the one who was taking care of them uh, is gone. So if again, it's not uh, handled well, it, also, it may lead to trauma. Then again, we have loss of a job. The sudden loss of a job can lead to a severe trauma uh, you remember, like now, we are experiencing pandemic uh, with COVID-19. We are the most people 
have lost their job, they are not able to, to keep uh, to keep their families running as uh, expected. We, we, we realize that even in our setups, uh, inadequate access to other basic needs like food, clothing, they are also not able to reach them. Again, due to these uh, laws of job, uh, they, we, they experience again low esteem and becomes depressed and feelings of unworthiness. It is because they are not able to start again as previous. Uh, then we talk of severe illnesses, uh, which may lead to long hospitalization. Hence, separating, uh, the, separating the people from other family members, and especially when they experience uh, some expensive surgeries, and which may also lead to disabilities, we are talking of also chronic uh, conditions uh, uh, like terminal illnesses, which uh, makes somebody feel that now you are not able, you are not able to start on your own again. You feel you get trauma, severe accidents leading to total disabilities, which may even affect uh, even a brain. Uh, it can also lead to other. Uh, other problems because when you get a severe accident, you become also uh, not able to start on your own again. That can lead to uh, to trauma. Then we talk of unreachable parents. We have those patients, uh, parents who are ever busy. They may be leaving the house very early in the morning and comes very late in the evening. So these parents, they have no time for the young ones. They don't even uh, guide them. They don't have uh, they, uh, these parents, uh, children because of lacking to see their parents as often as it should be. They feel that even their parents, they are rejecting them. They don't give them the guidance that may require. So at the end of it all, these uh, children may feel uh, neglected and their emotional or physical needs sometimes they are not attended to. So this may also lead to trauma when the young, the, the young ones be, uh, feels that they don't belong to anybody. Again, with the rejection, we are experiencing this even in, a, in our families because even uh, adults are being rejected by their family members. And this becomes uh, very painful and uh, it may lead to trauma, which may also lead to, uh, to mental illness in the future. Then we talk of political okay. or, or terrorism. Yeah, so one may, may be a victim of the same. And again, this leads to displacement, to displacements uh, from the, the places that we are, uh, we are familiar with. And when you are displaced, uh, you are taken to, you go to somewhere else that you are, you are not prepared to be or to go. So that uh, displacement causes a lot of trauma because you even don't know where to start or where to end. Then uh, in case somebody witnesses uh, such terrorism, uh, you become very much affected. And again, if it is not uh, addressed to, it may, may, may end up in getting uh, somebody becoming traumatized. Then also, uh, we, uh, some people will also experience panic attacks and phobias uh, after now experiencing all this or witnessing wars and uh, terrorism. Okay, again, we talk of too many siblings. Uh, okay, in our day today, there are there are families which have so many members in <laughs> siblings. So it may not be taken as so serious, but to some extent, some children may feel like they have been left out. Uh, remember with the economy today, uh, uh, we are not able to buy maybe for to, uh, to purchase something for all of the children in the house. So some may feel, depending on their uh, perception, they feel that maybe the, the parents, they don't uh, like, uh, they don't uh, love them. And therefore, depending again with the personalities of our young ones, they become traumatized. Sometimes we are also 
they may also lack basic needs like food. You are not able to put food on the table enough for the 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 for enough for everybody in the house. Again, clothing and as well as shelter. We have seen that even uh, uh, people with too many uh, siblings, uh, shelter, especially in urban in urban setups, it it has a lot of uh, problems because for you to accommodate uh, many siblings. Again, you have to get to get some uh, some money for you to take care in uh, shelter wise. Then we have learning disability in children. Okay, when the children are not able to study or perform how uh, the way they would wish to have uh, to perform, they become demoralized despite the much efforts may, they may be put. This may lead to fear. And uh, the, the, the young ones feel uh, they become, again, they, they develop uh, self, low self-esteem because they are not performing as per, uh, maybe the parents require them to do so or even themselves at, as they may, uh, they may feel that they need to perform. Then, so, so therefore, it in, they need to be encouraged and directed uh, right free. Otherwise, if not, they become traumatized because now they feel that they are out of place and they are not uh, performing as required. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that presentation on causes of trauma. And uh, it is well tackled. You can stop sharing your screen. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, participants, uh, we are aware now about the causes of trauma. And we'll go to the next presenter. Uh, the next presenter is Dr. Zablon Nyaberi. Uh, he'll, yeah, be speaking, he'll be speaking yeah. on childhood trauma and manifestation in adulthood. Zablon is a mental health specialist, lecturer of psychiatry at Masinde Moliro University of Science and Technology. So, Dr. Zablon, you are welcome to share your screen. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Ever, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, in, the, in this short uh, presentation, I'm going to cover uh, the following uh, in childhood uh, trauma. Uh, we will uh, look at how childhood uh, trauma will uh, manifest in adult, adulthood. And then uh, finally, we uh, uh, will have a look at uh, the management modalities that we have for uh, trauma. Now, childhood uh, trauma entails the damage to the psyche of a child after that child experiences or lives through an extremely frightening or distressing event, the ones that have been uh, covered by Elizabeth. Uh, after that experience, the, the, the traumatic events may lead to challenges in functioning or coping manually. And in children, you can't predict how a particular child is going to react to a traumatic event. Every child will react differently to traumatic events. Many of the children will recover after the traumatic event, especially if there is a, a proper support system for that particular child. And for that group of children, they will not develop a long-term uh, problems as a result of that uh, traumatic uh, situation. Some children, however, will go on to develop challenges immediately after 
or within a few months of the event. And one characteristic about uh, traumatic events and how they cause um, emotional and psychological trauma is that uh, even event, however trivial it might look to other people, even event or a situation makes a child feel lonely, helpless, and overwhelmed. That event or a situation will uh, cause emotional trauma or psychological trauma uh, to that particular child. And this is important. It doesn't have the situation or event doesn't have to involve a physical harm for it, for it to lead to psychological or emotional uh, trauma. And that objective, the objective facts and the subjective emotional experiences of the event are the ones that are going to determine how traumatic that particular event is going to be to, to be to that particular child. And as we know, the more the terror and helplessness that the child will feel, the more the child will be traumatized emotionally. And now from uh, MRI and the CT scans, we are able to know that uh, trauma uh, be it physical or emotional or social trauma, uh, changes the structure and the functioning of the brain. And as a result of that, uh, people uh, will have uh, uh, problems, especially during their adulthood, and especially if uh, um, the trauma uh, was not resolved. Uh, there are many events that uh, will cause emotional trauma in children. Many of them have been mentioned, accidents, bullying, uh, dysfunction of families or chaos in families, death of a loved one, emotional abuse, separation from a parent. Uh, this is important, especially for children or uh, a caregiver, sexual abuse, stress caused by deprivation and de deprivation can take many forms. It can be physical deprivation, social deprivation or emotional deprivation. All those will cause uh, uh, emotional trauma uh, in children. Uh, sudden, uh, and all serious medical conditions, uh, um, if a parent or a caregiver or the child themselves are diagnosed with a, a serious medical condition, that's what is likely to cause a psychological trauma in children. And then uh, neglect. And then there's another one that uh, is known as medical trauma, which entails medical procedures and illnesses that a child will experience. Eh? And this one, especially whatever the medical procedures, the ones that are invasive in nature, they're likely to cause uh, psychological trauma uh, in, in children. And then uh, there's another one known as refugee trauma, which entails being displaced from home or your country and the ready to flee to unfamiliar areas. Eh? That one can cause tremendous emotional uncertainty in a child and lead to psychological trauma. How then does um, childhood trauma, especially the one that is not been resolved, uh, present in adulthood? Eh? And following are the, some of the common physical, emotional and behavioral symptoms, uh, that uh, an unresolved childhood trauma uh, will cause. It will cause uh, a depression, 
uh, and depression, we, th there are several clinical manifestations of uh, 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 depression when someone has depression, like feelings of uh, helplessness, um, oversleeping, or not being able to sleep, overeating, or uh, depending on uh, an individual. Uh, then we have fatigue. Depression has many clinical manifestations. And so what I'm saying essentially is that uh, unresolved childhood trauma can lead to a number of uh, uh, mental illnesses in adulthood. And then uh, uh, those mental illnesses include uh, depression, which has a number of clinical manifestations anxiety and the attendant clinical manifestations of anxiety. And we have several types of uh, uh, anxiety. Uh, some people will resort to the use of uh, uh, drugs and alcohol in an effort to numb uh, uh, the, the feelings that come as a result of that uh, tra traumatic event that they experienced in childhood. Uh, and so, uh, substance abuse uh, can occur in people who experienced trauma in childhood. Uh, some of these people will have social interaction difficulties. Uh, they can have multiple health problems, including diabetes, mellitus, hypertension, uh, peptic ulcer disease, and uh, several other health problems. Uh, these people will have low self-esteem. Some of them will suffer from uh, eating disorders. And we have quite a number of eating disorders, including bulimia nervosa and anorexia nervosa, uh, binge eating, and several others. Some people will develop phobias. Huh? And you know, with the phobia, Avoidant or avoidance behaviors uh, will come in. Some people will experience panic attacks uh, with the attendant uh, clinical manifestations of uh, panic attacks. Some people will become extremely, will have extreme anger, and extreme anger or irritability is a clinical manifestation of depression. Some of them will have uh, emotional outbursts again a manifestation of uh, depression, poor concentration, a manifestation of depression. Some people will start to experience nightmares and the others will have convulsions. Uh, these are rituals that people perform in order to deal with the uh, obsessions. And then uh, some will uh, show uh, impulsiveness, uh, inability to, to be patient. Others will have emotional numbness. And uh, uh, the, the last one is uh, sleep, sleep uh, uh, disturbances. Again, a clinical manifestation of uh, depression. How do we then uh, manage uh, psychological trauma? Uh, and I must say that uh, well, through therapy, uh, both adults and children can overcome eh? uh, childhood uh, trauma. And we have a number of uh, uh, treatment modalities that can be used to manage uh, psychological trauma. Uh, some of them are uh, psychotherapeutic uh, in nature. Uh, others are uh, pharmacotherapeutic in nature. The ones that uh, the techniques that are uh, for, uh, psychotherapeutic in nature include cognitive processing, uh, trauma therapy, uh, trauma focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, we have others, I'm not going to details, eye movement desensitization and repro reprocessing. Uh, others will include the narrative exposure therapy. And then we have a prolonged exposure uh, therapy. All those fall under 
uh, psychotherapy or what people commonly call uh, counseling or talk therapy. Then we have well, the other modality which entails the use of drugs and drugs, we call it pharmacotherapy. Drugs are used uh, to manage the, 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 the symptoms of those uh, uh, mental illnesses that I mentioned earlier that can come as a result of, uh, that individuals can develop as a result of uh, psychological uh, uh, trauma. I'll not go into the details of uh, the drugs that can be used to manage uh, those symptoms, especially of anxiety and um, uh, depression. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zablon. I'm seeing a number of questions. But as we said in the beginning, we'll uh, answer questions at the end of the presentation. So just keep your questions and we'll be able to answer them. Uh, let me go to the next presenter. The next presenter is Wairimo Karongo. She's going to present on trauma-related issues in the public se sector uh, because she works with the Ministry of Health. Uh, Wairimo is a counseling psychologist with Ministry of, Ed of Health, deployed in Kemsa. She's highly experienced having worked in various governmental institutions for the last 27 years in various capacities. She rose from the humble beginning of being a classroom teacher in 1994 to her current position as Deputy Director Psychological Counseling. Werimo is a member of Kenya Counseling Psychological Association. So we welcome Wairimo, you can share your screen. I hope I'm visible, Dr. Yes. The screen is also visible. Yeah, but you can go to uh, starting, beginning. You can click on slideshow and from beginning. You can go to the beginning. I'll make the first one. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for- Kindly put slideshow so that we can actually maximize on it. Pardon? The slideshow. Mm, just on the corner, the left corner where the file is, just click from beginning there. The, the Down lower. There. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's better. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Wairimu Karongo, a public servant. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, causes and effects of trauma among the public servants. Uh, of course, public servants are individuals that have grown up from childhood. You've heard the area presenters talking about the traumas in childhood. There are also other things they come across as they continue growing. So of course, they, they, there'll be various causes of trauma as you are going to see. I have an outline there on uh, what is trauma. I've heard it has been tackled, common uh, traumas among the public servants, effect of trauma on public servants' well-being, dealing with the traumas or trauma among the public servants. Trauma has been defined, and uh, I'll just say it shortly that um, it is actually an, an emotional response to terrible events such as accidents, childhood and resolved issues, natural disasters, mass shootings, body attacks, rape, etc. I've named these ones because these are the, some of the things you'll come across as a public servant. You've seen our policemen working in various places. Whenever there is a natural disaster, you've seen our, the public servants are there taking care of the issues. I don't know whether you have ever asked yourself when that person goes home after tackling the various people or dealing with the various people who have experienced a lot of trauma, 
you know, what is their health? What is the state of their mental health? Whenever there is a major accident, the policemen are called to collect the bodies, take them to the mortuaries. All this will cause traumas. So I won't go back to all this because they have been tackled. But I want to say that public servants are prone to various types of traumatic experiences by virtue of their interactions with their environment. Here, the environment will refer to their work, the places of work. It will also refer to their homes. What are they experiencing in their homes? So most of this has been tackled, but I want to mention that um, accidents, maybe in childhood, in adulthood, natural disasters, political upheavals, such as post-election violence, terrorist attacks, you've seen them, Westgate, Ducit, Garissa, all these are things that public servants have to deal with because when these things happen, they are the frontline uh, responders. And uh, of course, it will affect them, it will affect their mental health because, for example, you remember Garissa University, 141 people are killed, most of them students. There were police, policemen who are responding to that. You have also seen um, some very traumatic uh, incidences in Northeastern where teachers, medical personnel are uh, attacked. And of course, these are very, very uh, traumatic experiences. So you expect that there will, there, there will be a lot of suffering in terms of uh, mental wellness, the public servants involved, the responders, the one who respond to those uh, events as they take place, they also be affected. Types of traumas, I've looked at them. Um, I've mentioned the three types. We have the acute trauma, which results from a single traumatic incident. Then we have chronic, which may be repeated and prolonged. In, for example, bullying, domestic violence. We also have complex, exposed to varied and multiple traumatic traumatic experiences. So, for example, we have, med we have uh, sexual abuse, medical traumas. When a, when a medical, when a medical issue you have, which is being de dealt with goes wrong, it can be very traumatic. I don't know whether you remember the person who went to Kenyatta he was not supposed to be operated on the head, but that is where he was operated. Of course, that was a very traumatic experience for him and even for the, the doctors, the nurses involved. So how do we deal with these traumas when, 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 when something like this, something traumatic happens as public servants? What happens? How should it be dealt with? The first thing is uh, being close to loved ones and colleagues for support. Uh, you have to be close to the loved ones, to the colleagues, let them offer you all the support they can. Then there is also the facing your fears. Some people avoid the issues. If you are possibly been in a traumatic experience, for example, the policemen who have been taken somewhere to collect bodies, you find some deserting work. But then we are told that it is important to face your fears because even if you avoid the, the traumatic experience does not uh, go away, then there is also prioritizing self-care. Always make sure that you are up to speed with your self-care, eat well, sleep well, exercise where possible, take walks, talk to people, surround yourself with people, all this will help. And then we have the most important one, which I've talked a little bit about, psychological first aid. When uh, something of traumatic nature happens, there is uh, what can be offered, known as psychological first aid. Uh, this is an initial emergency response in helping people in distress so that they can calm, calm down and... Uh, they can be supported to cope better with their, with their challenges they are having. 
Now, the goal is to promote uh, safety, stability of survivors, and connect individuals to help, to help services, information, and resources. For example, in case there is a natural disaster, people need to be uh, given help, maybe food. They need to be given information where to escape. They need to be stabilized. And uh, the basis of uh, psychological first aid is caring about the person in distress and showing empathy. And uh, psychological first aid, uh, I've said what it is not. It is not only given by professionals. Whenever there is, uh, people are facing trauma, they should not just go to the professionals. Anyone who is around can be able to offer, uh, to offer psychological first aid. Talk, you can talk to the people. We know that there are people who reach uh, in a place of disaster, the first responders. These ones can offer psychological first aid. They may not necessarily be counselors. They may not be medical professionals, but they can be able to you know, discuss whatever is distressing and help people analyze what they are going through. And um, although uh, psychological first aid involves uh, being available and being able to listen to people's story, it is not pressuring people to tell their feelings or reactions to the event, but you are helping them to calm down by talking about what they went through. So in case of emergencies, there are things that you will check. There are things that you, 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 you will check as you are giving uh, psychological first aid. You will check the education of the people concerned. Of course, if people, have, if people are in the village and they have had a traumatic experience and you are a civil servant, you've been sent there, you don't go there and talk in English. Check your environment. Is it, uh, you know, what is happening in, the, in your environment? Huh? Then there is also the emergency event. You know, the nature of the event that has caused the trauma or is causing the trauma, then the community itself, uh, the, the, the community which is in conflict or which is undergoing the experience, are they prepared? If they are not prepared, how can you help them so that they can be able to settle down and feel more safe? So, and PFA in times of emergency, because I'm assuming that most of the traumatic experience, have, they are not things that are foreseen or the things that have been planned. So whenever there is an emergency, you will expect trauma and, uh, People have to be helped to feel safe, to feel connected to others, to feel calm. And um, they also have to have uh, social, physical, and emotional support. And they have to be helped to regain control and to be able to handle their own situation. So who, who gets PFA? I've talked about civil servants. But of course, civil servants do not uh, live in isolation. Sometimes they are the ones who are supposed to give that psychological first aid. And uh, sometimes they have lost families, they have lost friends. There are a lot of people that will, be, will need to be helped. We also have the, the health the workers. They may be there to respond. We have, um, and of, I want you to remember that whenever people or, and the civil servants are dealing with these traumas, even themselves, they also get traumatized. If, for example, you are, have gone to a place where there is disaster and you have experienced a lot of human suffering, you are also going to be, uh, to be traumatized by that event. And therefore, there is need for you to also get um, uh, debriefing or psychological first aid. So PFA, this is just what is given at the point of contract with the distressed people, the, that talking to people, that coming them down and all that kind of, of thing. And uh, it has to be given where there is safety. If people are, ha, ha, if there is flooding where these people are and they are traumatized, 
you can't continue to give them PFA in their position. You've got to tell them to move in places where they are safe. These days we have the virtual counseling. It can be given, you know, they can be counseled virtually. And um, of course, uh, this will calm them down. Apart from giving the people uh, PFA, there is also need for giving them basic needs. And uh, you have seen this, right? Uh, during the, uh, the Ducid too, and even the Westgate, there were people who volunteered. They gave a lot of food stuff. I remember one lady who would always have this, the policemen breakfast. They would serve them breakfast, they would serve them supper because the situation had stayed for long. So this helps uh, the civil servants deal with the situation themselves. And they are also able to help the people who are helping them in dealing with, with whatever trauma they are experiencing. And uh, when, when people are being supported, it is important to note about their culture, their religion. For example, if you are in uh, northeastern parts of Kenya, you have to be very careful because you know that you cannot just go there and talk to their lady alone. Uh, they need to, they they need to to be accompanied by a male relative. So when you are giving uh, support, you you have also to be cognizant to the fact or to the culture, to the religion, and even to you know the type of people you are talking to. Then. Uh, it is important to show respect, to treat people with dignity, to ensure that as much as you are giving them psychological first aid, you are not, uh, you are not, um, you are treating them with fairness, that they don't feel discriminated, they don't feel disrespected, they have also to feel safe and secure in uh, whatever you are doing. So when you are giving uh, psychological first aid, you have to look, listen, and link. Whoever you are giving, whether it is a civil servant, whether it is the general public, uh, you have to look, listen, and link. Uh, what do I mean, look? This one is refer to you know, the current situation who is seeking support, what are the risks, what are the needs, etc. Then listen. Uh, when the person affected by trauma is talking, it is good to pay attention. Accept their feelings. If they are not calm, you cannot just force calmness. Give them time. This is what I mean by listening. Then also there is linking because you if somebody is undergoing a traumatic experience, you cannot be there every day. You need to give these people information, then connect them to loved ones. You know, when there is a disaster, sometimes children get lost, people lose their loved ones. You need to connect them. That is why you find that whenever there is a disaster, Red Cross is very good at this. It usually opens a desk and people are advised to go to that desk, report a missed one, so that now uh, the, the people who that have been found can also be linked with their loved ones. It's also very important you link people with those or uh, to those who can assist them during trauma. Again, teach these people coping strategies. Coping strategies, whenever they have undergone a traumatic experience. There are several coping strategies that can be done, getting enough rest, eating regularly, call and talk to family as frequently as possible, discuss problems with someone you trust, relax. I had talked about all this, but then some people may think that uh, using drugs, alcohol, it may reduce the trauma, it doesn't. These are things to avoid if you care about your health. And uh, because they might worsen, they might worsen the trauma. 
Then the other one is to attend to personal hygiene and also find safe ways to help others. Even when you are undergoing a trauma yourself, as a public service or a servant or a general, uh, a general citizen, it is very important that you help others. We've seen people in disaster. They, if they have come out with some of the items from the house, you find them save, uh, sharing with those who do not have. It gives you a lot of joy when you find that you can offer help when someone is undergoing some suffering. And then when you're giving these uh, PFA or support, of course you cannot give it forever. So you must know when to add your assistant so that people can be able to start on their own uh, because it is not possible for you to keep people somewhere and always help them. So start trying to delink the people so that they can see that uh, you are not abandoning them, but you have given them as much help as possible. But then you, they, you have to allow them to deal with the experiences themselves. So that is uh, one way I found that it can be used in dealing with the traumas. We use it in public service when there is a natural disaster. Uh, we use it on our employees. Uh, even when the, during the time of COVID, we had, we had to give a lot of support you know that people got COVID and some were traumatized the way they were treated. So we, uh, we, ad we advise them to get a lot of psychological first aid, either from our office or even from people close to them. So there you can get some further reading on uh, some publication, because as you are aware, traumas are a major cause of mental health problem. So you can get further reading as I've indicated in my slides. And uh, that I think brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope I've been uh, of help. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Wairimo. That was very helpful. People are asking what is PFA, psychological first aid. So today we have learned something new about psychological first aid. And we have been told it's not the preserve of the professionals. Anyone can offer this. And we've been given some reference there. We can go to that reference and be able to learn more about PFA. So thank you. You may stop sharing. OK, we go to the next presenter. Uh, the next presenter is Justin Kimani. One of the causes of mental health issues is the fact that we are not able to balance life or work and leisure. So Justin is, go is going to give us a few tips on how to do this. Uh, so Justin Kimani will present on work-life balance. He's a counseling psychologist, a member of Kenya Counseling Psychologists Association, He's a consultant in conflict management, a court accredited mediator, and a certified uh, addiction counselor. So welcome, Justin. Justin, you can... Uh, you, we Thank are you, Dr. Terry. Yeah, we'd like, you, Dr. Your, we'd like to see your face well. Eh? You are, you're right down there. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. Can you see it well now? I have the whole of it on my body. Okay. <laughs> you can right. see it now? Yes. Uh, very well. Uh, Are you able to share you. your screen? Uh, let me try. If I hesitate, then you can come to my aid. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, Yes, um, I think I'm getting there. Okay. All can right. You see it? Yes. You can see it now? Yes, we can. Thank you and welcome all of us. Um, I think I've been introduced by name and uh, background. 
And I'll go straight away to the topic of uh, uh, work-life balance uh, um, and go straight to explaining it because I think that it is usually taken for granted um, and not knowing what inability to strike a balance between working and recreation, what effect it has. So uh, work-life balance is the ability to strike a balance between working and recreation. And it is important uh, as it may, may, for, for maintaining the balance uh, to have a healthy family and a working environment for improved productivity. So work-life balance help, helps to reduce stress. And one of the participants posed a question, how you can deal with, uh, with, with, with the stress. And work-life balance is one of those which helps to reduce stress and prevents burnout. Um, stress is pre prevalent, is a prevalent mood disorder in the workplace. And workplace here, as, as I will explain later, refers to everything that you do, wherever it is, whether it's in the office, whether it's at home in your kitchen, whether it is at school for children, that is work, anything that engages your energy and, and, and mind. So family care or family uh, lifestyle is the time we spend on our families well-being in the midst of other work that we carry out daily. Many of us think that working for long hours from 6 a.m. in the morning to 8 at night is what um, makes life uh, better. That is exactly the opposite. Working too many hours in the office and leaving no time uh, for time with your family, children, your spouse, uh, needs to be introduced so that there is a, a balance between the two. So work-life balance, therefore, is striking a middle ground between the time we spend working and recreation in our everyday life. Um, it, we go on to explain that work, work can be defined as physical or mental effort or activity uh, directed towards the productivity or accomplishment of a task. That energy you 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 summon, that mental effort that you need to do that work, uh, is what is work. It can be a trade, it can be a profession, it can be a career or other means of of livelihood. It is something that one is doing, making or performing, especially as an occupation or undertaking, a duty or task that amounts to the day's work. And remember, a day's work, as I've said, is anything that takes some energy and time from you, that summons your resources beyond what the resources are capable of doing. It is something that occupies time and energy, creating competition for your attention. Your attention is only limited to um, a certain amount. So when you hear us saying that you are double tasking or doing th two things at the same time, it's, it's burning a lot of energy from your body and weakening it. So the amount of effort to produce something to accomplish a task or, or a ground of tasks Further explanations is that the people, what people do in their houses is also work, have just, as I have just explained, cooking, cleaning, supervising the children as they do their homework, all that is work. And you need a break from all that occasionally so that you can recoup, you can regenerate, you can um, um, gain more um, energy to do the next thing. So, so work-life balance is coined from the work or career and ambition. Lifestyle itself, which we are saying, you should have some lifestyle that breaks you from uh, or disengages you from the routine work is engaging in acts of pleasure, leisure, rest, sleep, as somebody else has, say, uh, has said, attending movies, or picnics, walking just briskly, uh, being with the family somewhere and 
um, or, or being uh, engaging yourself in spiritual uh, development and meditation and sports and games, things that take you away from the routine of, of the day. So work-life balance connotes prioritizing between work and leisure or pastime, the balance or boundary between uh, an individual's work and how one utilizes the rest of the time entirely with the family or creation. You need a lot of time with your family, with your spouse, with the children, as a way of breaking from what you have been doing throughout the day so that you can re-energize and get ready for the next day's work. The more this boundary between the, work, the time you spend on work and the time you spend uh, with your family or with leisure, um, the, uh, makes, uh, makes the, the more this boundary is blurred, the higher work-life conflict is manifested by employees in, in the office. This will start showing in the office. It will also show, start showing at home that you are overdoing things. Even however good these things are, you are overdoing some part of it without leaving some of the time for the rest of what you need in life. So employees in the at work, which for almost two years uh, uh, became the workplace for many people as a result of the pandemic. We are talking about the time when we were locked up. You remember we stayed um, in houses together with our spouses, with, your fam with our family, with our children of all ages. That created an experience which we had not uh, seen before. And as a result, and we'll see it later on, conflicts started uh, because of the things you have, to, the resources you have to share in the house, uh, which has not been uh, shared before. Space suddenly becomes smaller. You become more familiar with each other. Certain colors which you never saw with each of you starts showing and creating anxiety, which leads to stress and depression, also to domestic violence, and you have seen the recent uh, rises in the number of suicides, suicides and murders of whole families. Uh, all these are uh, as a result of doing one of the things, working two, two long hours without uh, sharing that some of the time that you have uh, with the family. Uh, move, moving on, we need to get, uh, to get out work-life balance right to manage stress which leads to poor work performance, strained family relations or conflict. Uh, the prolonged time together in the, in the house uh, of the parents, as I've just said, children of all ages, small children, adolescents, and young adults, and you know that their characteristics, their needs are different, uh, create conflict in the family. We need to strike a balance between the time we spend with them together, so that and the, the, that time should also be explained, so that people don't get fatigued of long hours together. Break that what you are doing with some leisure, walk about um, in in wherever you can you can, you can go, uh, brisk walking, so that you break the routine. So spouses working from home, siblings. Uh, doing schoolwork online and family chores, competing over space, which I've just talked about, that has usually been um, been adequate because you never have had to, to, to sit together on the same table except for short periods of time when having dinner. But now, during that time when there was COVID, we sat there together sharing the only laptops there were, the only phones or, tele, or, or TVs there were. These are issues that might have brought conflict. We have covered all that about the, what we experienced uh, during the, the, the pandemic. And we need to sandwich the number of hours that we work with spare time uh, on family and rest. And in this case, none of them would suffer, hence the need for work-life balance. If, struck, if, we, if, if we struck a balance between the time work we work and the time we have with our families, uh, there, this, this, these cases of conflicts in the house uh, would not occur. So what are the advantages of work-life balance? Work-life balance makes employees 
or other workers more committed to their working life, which leads to increased productivity both at home and in the office. And now you know from some of the experiences that some offices have provided uh, recreations in their work compounds. Some of them have even introduced baby care facilities so that uh, they feel cared for, uh, so that neither work nor leisure should have too much time or too little time as that will, 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 will make the, the bodies weaker, the people will suffer from uh, poor health and so on and so forth. So at creation, as you know, as we all know, God in his wisdom gave man direction for work, life, uh, for work life balance. If you read Genesis 2, 3, God rested from all the work which he had done after six days. And God gave direction to have a work life balance, but people choose to work seven days a week, sometimes working 24 hours in a day. Some even look for a 25th hour in a day, which is not available. That is overworking yourself and being unable to do the next thing, like spending time with your family. You go home very tired, angry with everyone. Sometimes you choose to, to pass through what we call um, um, a jam rescue, social places where you, you stop over to Past time, Th these are desirable things because they they don't promote either your work or or your your life with the family. So it lowers lower absenteeism and less malingering. Um, a more contented, less stressed workforce improves workers' health and well-being. Um, improved positive perception of the employer. If the employer provides these facilities. Um, the, empl the employee perceives the employer as a person who cares and it motivates work, workers' loyalty and commitment. So continuing with advantages of employers' work-life balance, the employer should have work-life balance policies encompassing flexible working policies because that increases employee accountability and commitment, enhances teamwork, communication and positive attitude towards the tasks that are given. To the employer, this reduces staff turnover and recruitment costs, uh, it meets customer demands through shift work, part-time work and uh, flex time. Uh, part-time work and flex time meets seasonal peaks and, and lowers, lower and lowers and enhances competi competitiveness, which becomes better option for the employer. Uh, Part-time working, especially for mothers, uh, for, mother, for mother's job sharing, flex time, working from home, especially during the pandemic, and paid career breaks and sabbatical schemes for self-improvement allow employees extra days, whether paid or unpaid, when they have a genuine uh, reason. So we need to create flexible leave policies. For example, mothers can be given more leave time uh, to nurse their babies when they have just had uh, new babies. This can be on a half day, um, half, half pay of the first few months after maternity leave or unpaid leave if they require more time uh, to create a family friendly work environment. There are also holiday schemes additional to their annual settlement, set, uh, entitlements, entitlements for employees, paternity, and these days we are experiencing even but, um, fathers being given leave to go and share, uh, looking at the at, at, at a new arrival, a new baby. A parent who has a sick child at home will not be effective at work, so that must be allowed also so that if a child falls home, there's somebody to relieve that mother to go and look after the, the child. So work-life balance proposals uh, create attractive working environment. Uh, free, uh, we should have, for example, free exercise classes, uh, free subsidized canteen or club company days. Uh, some organizations have even clubs and facilities in which after work people can go there and socialize and even play games. Uh, they also provide child care centers. Uh, others 
provide paid study leave or leave of absence and so on and, and so forth. Some of the reasons for lack of work balance is our ambition. We need to achieve, we, we want to achieve certain things uh, in our lives. But even if we tried this without breaking the routines, we shall not achieve those personal ambitions. So hard work for recognition and promotion are some of the reasons that we, 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 we do not uh, get work-life balance. We want to be recognized. We need promotions. Pressure of family obligations are other reasons why we keep working from very early in the morning to very late in the evening. You are creating a different problem by being away from the family for that long. Family and personal financial requirements are another reason that people work too hard at the expense of work-life balance. The other reason is acceleration of technology. For example, electronic connectivity, being engaged over long periods in WhatsApp, you might not know, but what all that time you spend reading your WhatsApp and SMSs and email, answering phones, you might not think that that is work. But remember some of the messages you get there as messages from the office. I want to suggest that when you leave the office, leave the office in the office. And when you go home, you don't have your office with you. When you leave the home to go back to the, go to the office, leave home at home, except for emergencies, so that you can attend fully to the office or home as uh, might be demanded. But make sure that there is uh, a, a balance maintained. We are not talking about 50-50 balance, but the consciousness that you need a break um, uh, to, to try and get, get, get a, a bit of each of them. There is a feeling by many workers that simply working hard is not rewarded enough and that there is need for stretching one's limit by anything that can bring an extra shilling. That is true. But what is the cost of that? For example, when you do part-time, you have been doing a whole day's work and you still continue to do part-time job or coaching students and things like those like we all do or going farming, something that is also taxing your, your brains, which you have been using throughout the day. You are not having a work-life balance. So what time is left is often divided up among relationships, kids, and sleep, which means there is, there is no quality time to these areas. All these areas require quality time so that you can rejuvenate to do the following day's work and also cultivate a mood to be with your family. The adverse effects of work-life conflict, according to recent global studies, um, feel that the work pressure are self-inflicted. You don't have to do this. You, you need to be conscious that doing one of them for too long hours is costing you health problems, giving you stress, anxiety, depression, and many other bad things. So this is more true than before because of the pandemic, which we have already talked about. Workers feel that stress is affecting their interpersonal and intimate relationships. Uh, so consequences of lack of work-life balance for the individual, for example, is a chronic lack of time for family. Um, stresses and strains that lead in the long term to irreversible physical signs of wear and tear, cardiovascular disease and lack of immunity, which is important uh, to, beat the, uh, to beat the sicknesses, stiff muscles, e.g., which we always feel, you keep wondering why your neck and shoulders are, and the back aches, why are they aching? What is it a result of? It's because you have been stressing yourself on one thing for too long without a break. That's the break we are looking for. Uh, consequences of lack of work-life work balance, it sometimes leads to dysfunctional families. We have already talked about that, especially during the just experienced COVID. Uh, due to stress, the spouses blame one another for the hardships they are going through. They are not the causes of the COVID, but they seem to apportion blame between each other. Children become withdrawn as parents do not have enough time. That's already been talked about by one of, by one of the earlier speakers. They do not have enough, enough time for them. And they believe they are not, they believe they are not uh, loved. 
it, it, sometimes, it sometimes leads to dysfunctional families, especially during this time. That's a, that's a repetition. Um, children, especially teenagers, become rebellious as parents do not seem to have time for them. Can somebody put on that echo? Seem to have time for them and they believe they are mis being uh, misunderstood. Um, I think that is the far we can cover uh, for now, and we shall cover more when uh, questions arise. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, Justin. So you can stop sharing your screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm sure there are questions that will come after the presentations. We have only two more presentations and we call it a day. Uh, the next uh, presenter is Reverend Dr. Claude Mwansa Kimpind. Uh, he's going to talk to us about trauma and related issues in the church in South Africa, where he has served as a church minister uh, for 15 years. Uh, Dr. Claude has a PhD in practical theo theology, pastoral care, and counseling with the University of, Pre of Pretoria in South Africa. He, ha he has advanced religious, he is a, an advanced religious specialist in Christian pastoral counseling in South Africa, and currently he's based in UK, uh, and he's a minister in the Methodist Church in Britain. So welcome, Dr. Claude. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rebecca, and thank you for all the panelists, and greetings to all that are listening to us. You know, it's quite uh, extensive, which uh, I feel like everything that they've said is really, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, what I, I need just to bring up a light uh, in the pastoral perspective as a clergy and the time that I've spent in South Africa to be facing all these uh, factors of uh, mental illness, and especially we are reflecting on the trauma. And then, uh, you know, the background of South Africa with apartheid and all those things that a traumatic situation that put the, the people of Mandela throughout. And that's the ground that uh, uh, I was having time to minister in different contexts of South Africa. And I think uh, all the, the panelists have touched a lot, a lot uh, reflecting on what the trauma is. I think this kind of similarities that you can see from not to repeat myself or about all the factors. And then uh, I, I think I, I, I'll try to bring something just to as an input on the management as a, a clergy and especially as a, a pastoral care. Uh, in South Africa, I, I was, let me get uh, uh, Soweto, I was there for a number of years as a minister in a context where uh, we were receiving different people for counseling and especially where there's uh, all these things that they've uh, given us by different professionals that uh, they've uh, presented earlier. And then uh, to, to, to come up with a sense of where as a pastoral carer, we, we need to start to journey with those people that are, are, are traumatized in different perspective and especially uh, in South Africa, this kind of uh, domestic violence, this uh, uh, poverty, these things that have triggered the violence in the house, these scams, these many things which uh, we can be rape. Uh, those are, 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 are recurrent people that we were receiving for to give counseling and try to generate them in different perspective, at least to bring life or confidence and to see those people to regain their life and then to start journeying accordingly to what life is. But there's few things in that management that I want to bring to the attention as a, a pastoral carer. And uh, there's a sense of when people come to you, there's a few things that I want to refer to one of our, our panelists to refer about to look, listen, and link. That's become very, very important to us as a clergy and pastoral care for people that are coming with that type of factors, a traumatic uh, situation they are going through. 
and then uh, you need to be able to look and to listen to them and be able to link but in our perspective and then we try to go with uh, the positive deconstruction and uh, to say in a sense where the person can be able to to, to journey and uh, to reframe for transformation and that healing in a sense in future we can see that the person is out of that emotional condition that they are in called a trauma and then uh, their background some such africans is not because South african is quite uh, a mixture of uh, different uh, community from Africa. Uh, there are Nigerians, there are people from Somalia. There's many people around there and that the context uh, creates a kind of syndicate. There are people are busy just to scam others. Now you receive the victims, those they've been scammed to be receiving some kind of counseling and to join with them by that deconstruction of their current mind or the fear that that thing is brought in their lives. Another point is about to, to in that journey, because you need to be able to start listening for them to get some kind of uh, confidence and trust in you as the counselor. And then it's not just someone will come, regardless of what the person is experiencing and going through, they need to be reaching a point to be able to listen to your story and then you to listen to their stories for you guys to join together. And that we reach a point also reframing that person must be trusting you for you to be able to journey, for to listen to their situations, for and uh, to reach a point for them to start getting a sense of confidence and healing and coming back to that real sense of that trigger, the trauma in their lives uh, as a, a victim of scam or domestic violence or rape or other things that currently is happening in South Africa is about the manipulation, the spiritual manipulation that some of other pastors or they've put people through and promising them things which they cannot see them uh, uh, realizing themselves. It's brought some kind of trauma in those people. And when they are victims on that side, they come to you for counseling and listen for you to redefine, to reframe their trust in God again, because what they've seen is not really what the Bible was demonstrating to them. Those are type of reality that you are joining on the top of what the list or other panelists they've, they've brought to our attention this evening. There's also another possibilities of shepherding, mean that you're joining with them, but down to bring to the attention of all of us that those are management uh, methods that we can use as counselor in a, in, a, in a spiritual perspective or in a pastoral care perspective, and then to be able to journey with the people that they are seeking counseling uh, to us as a pastoral care or pastoral, pastoral counseling, counselor. Now, in our process of counseling, is that that's the listening because the storytelling become very important for at least the person that is seeking help to you as a counselor to be using some kind of storytelling for to allow the person to go deeper to herself or himself to bring up what was the cause and then to start dismissing the fear or the uncertainty that the trauma has brought in their lives. Now, we, we need to, to make sure in a sense where that, for instance, what happened in South Africa currently in Durban, as you know, everyone was on TV and see the flooding that happened there. I think other panelists, they'll refer to that as, as the cause of trauma coming to those things because I left South Africa quite uh, seven years from now, but I'm reflecting on the ministry and the experience that I've listened to people. Another point is about bereavement. You know, I was in Soweto and then it was like almost every Saturday I supposed to go and bury, you know, people in, uh, in the cemetery called Avalon. And then imagine when you go to bury, it's not just to go, there's a pre-counseling preparations that you went through with the family, the whole family to see in which way that people can be understand the, the cause of the death. And uh, there's other realities coming around the church if you, 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 are, you are a church goers, you can understand other churches, there's pledges that will be paid. And then if that person that passed on could not pay the pledge, 
mean that the church is not going to take care of the bereavement. That's another another drama, a traumatic space where you need to go and journey with the family to make them understand the regulation of the church and the reality that people are going through. You see, those are a cause of traumas that are coming through the ministry as clergy in a South African perspective for us to journey with the people for them at least to gain confidence and to be healed in that process of, uh, of ministry. You see, there's a abuse of alcohol, there's a abuse of other substances, drugs, and it becomes very, very special in uh, young people that are going through those experiences. And then there are fights that are happening or there are people are just killing each other. You know, it's sometimes just they can shoot someone for a phone or something just we cannot understand. Those are fears and then are creating serious traumas in the community that we're serving as clergy and uh, uh, pastoral carers. I think that's I want us to get in few lines as we could not bring up some kind of presentation. We just shared the experience as a uh, uh, doctor uh, Rebecca requesting us to come up with just kind of experience which will allow us to reflect on what the professionals have presented to us this after, this evening to, to come up with a personal care because of that reframing or deconstruction that positively can deconstruct the journey of that person, at least the person to be healed. We are, we are using also shepherding method or a counseling perspective or storytelling method to allow people to gain confidence for their healing and transformation in this process of traumatic event that's happened. And finally, in concluding this, this thing can be short and then can be also post-traumatic disorder where people are taking very long time for them to come back to our senses or for or kind of healing or to reframe themselves to start things, thing, to see things differently because of those realities that are triggers of the to the trauma that people are going through. I think those are a few things I want just to contribute tonight. And then to see as uh, other people, they've referred to many things. And then I think these few lines could give us some uh, clarity on what is happening in South Africa so far around the trauma and uh, the factor and cause of it. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Claude for that presentation. At least we have realized that uh, the main causes are everywhere, whether it's South Africa or in Kenya. And thank you for your presentation. And the fact that uh, you have emphasized what uh, I think Wairimo presented, the importance of uh, psychological first aid and the three principles, look, listen, and link. So that is wonderful. Okay, now we have the last presenter, last but not the least. Uh, he is uh, Reverend Francis Itiri. You, you'll also share his perspective about trauma in the church in UK where he has been for the last five years. Uh, Reverend Francis is a church minister in Thom Northampton Methodist Circuit and he's an associate cha chaplain at the University of North Northampton. United Kingdom. So welcome, Francis. Uh, uh, please uh, share just briefly as we conclude the day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rebecca. And a good evening to all members of this panel. Good evening. I want to appreciate all what other speakers are presented. And I think being the last, I'll just mention a few things that have not been mentioned in their presentation. There are about four. One of the fact is that we need to appreciate that trauma exists in every person, be it from an individual point of view or a collective point of view, especially when we talk of disasters, uh, among other things. But in this part of the world, the United Kingdom, there are certain things that you have to be very careful how you explore and how you guide people to deal with them because of certain laws related to what we call safeguarding policies and uh, safe places in discussing these matters. But one of the facts that you know very well that for many years, the United Kingdom 
has experienced one of the greatest tra traumas, especially during the World War II. That's for fact. And uh, during uh, one of the triggers uh, for these traumatic experiences is when we do remembering services every year, which occurs in November. Like at this, this year, we're going to do a remembrance service on the 13th of November. So those dates, they trigger a very bad experiences that the British people, the people of the UK have lived with uh, from generations. Number two, uh, uh, one of the other trauma uh, that uh, this world experiences is what I'm calling abduction. People getting abducted, and they get lost, never to be found uh, again. And uh, so these kind of experiences, of course, are triggered by birthday party celebration, or maybe an anniversary wedding of a family, or maybe a baptism uh, for that matter. Uh, so, uh, and and, uh, and uh, so therefore, of course, again, uh, number three uh, trauma is what I just call uh, racism, and other form of discrimination. Some of you, the panelists here, you understand very well, uh, the uprising for the life matter, especially during George Floyd death, that, that, that of course spread across the world. Uh, at any time a black person is being victimized, it, 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 or, or being stopped by a police for a check, it, it triggers. Uh, uh, the levels of racism and the discrimination. And of course, the other one that I wanted to mention is a case of what I call homelessness, which is as a result of systems and structures, especially when a member of a family dies. That's what, that was what means the person maybe was been sharing uh, that house because they are not registered by the council, find themselves out in the street and becoming homeless. Uh, so, so, so the last one is uh, is is uh, is uh, is uh, um, I think I've mentioned. <laughs> now, now, what, what does what, what does that has to do with Christianity? What does this has to do with faith? Uh, what, one of the things, the challenges that I want to say briefly is the challenge of the Christian practitioners integrating theology psychology and shared experiences. Uh, so this is one of the strategy mechanisms uh, to ensure people are given an opportunity to come out and share their experiences because me doing it or maybe another professional doing it, it can be very intimidating. But when these people are giving uh, uh, safe places uh, to share, their experiences within the faith community, because I'm sure you agree that uh, being in a church uh, a forum, uh, uh, communities, faith-based communities, uh, people feel very safe. And when they share these experiences, I think the professionals come along the way to help them and guide them in the recovery uh, program. So it is very important that uh, some of these observations that I, 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 I'm looking at it. And of course, finally, I think is what Dr. Claude, Claude has, has mentioned. Uh, and uh, some, some of you, of course, you accept it. I mentioned this during our mental class, and this is the final thing I'm going to mention. The dichotomy between spirituality and professionalism. Sometimes religious pastors uh, do not sometimes understand when a person is really going through a trauma related to an episode in their life experiences, in particular, if they were abused when they were young children. For example, if, if, if it was to do with a child sexual abuse or something related with sexual molestations at places of work. Some of these things are sometimes uh, uh, religious uh, people sometimes, uh, and because I came to understand this when I came in this other part of the world, there are things that people and experiences that happen in people's life. Uh, sometimes people live with them for long and they are not, they are afraid to share. 
because if they share, then it will be a call and a halter for salvation. Who want to be born again today? That kind in quote. So, so, so I, I'm, I'm sure you have seen this, that uh, people are told maybe you have a demon, uh, uh, maybe that is causing you sleepless, that is causing you, disturbing you, that is mentally uh, uh, interfering with your, you, in your coherency, absence at work, poor social relationship. Uh, uh, the mitigation approach here is uh, a religious practitioner like me, like Claudia, and other pastors working together with professionals in helping to dichotomize whatever is going through their lives. That's my case today as a summary, Dr. Rebecca and your panelists. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for that input, even uh, concerning the situation in UK. Uh, but we are realizing that uh, there is need for a holistic approach uh, of course, religious organizations are important because they, they're able to guide us spiritually, but at the same time, we also need the professionals. And therefore, a holistic uh, approach is required in helping people with mental health issues. Now, this is the time for our questions as we wind up our session. Uh, I saw a number of uh, questions that had been written on the chat. Uh, Someone was asking, can verbal abuse of a, a child by a parent cause trauma in adulthood? I don't know who can go first. Uh, is Dr. Zablon here? Dr. I, 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 I wrote something on that. Uh -huh, yes. Yeah, on the, on the chat, I have answered some of the questions. Mm -hmm. But basically the answer is yes. Verbal abuse, physical abuse, they are a source of traumas to both children and adults. Okay. All right. Yes. I think the other questions you were able to answer, somebody was asking, how do you help a traumatized child? I think we, you have mentioned on ways of uh, managing trauma or helping people who have gone through traumatic uh event so another one was Actually, asking what yes maybe for the the child mm -hmm. i i have mentioned that the the child if for example the trauma is maybe sexual abuse mm -hmm. or physical abuse the child should be removed from the source because if the child is experiencing trauma and they continue to stay in the same place then things are going to be worse. So they can be moved so that the, the trauma is reduced. I, I think I have also mentioned something like of that sort. Okay. Let's say quickly, uh, uh, maybe it's also important uh, to involve uh, children welfare officers, people involved in children's safety. Uh, to, to be able to know exactly what is happening with these children. It's very important, I think, from the point of go uh, for welfare officers, either in the government who deal with children affairs. Okay, thank you for that addition. Uh, I'd say, Dr. Terry, Dr. Terry mm -hmm. um, uh, that, and, and, and the last speaker has just mentioned it, that removing that child from where and when where it happened in what circumstances from the scene reduces the, the the impact of that of that trauma so that he or she is not reminded from time to time uh, what what happened and where it happened okay thank, thank you. you justin for that input uh, there was another question i don't know whether wairimo can answer this one uh, somebody was asking about eye movement descent desensitization and reprocessing therapy uh, to treating trauma, whether it is effective. I don't know whether you saw that, uh, Wairimo. For us, we do not use that. Mm -hmm. Maybe the, the, the uh, was it Jane Kamau, the, the lady from Malari, maybe if they do that, 
they can she can put, have an input. But for us, general psychologists, we do not use the, the eye movement. Okay, Elizabeth, are you in? Yes, I'm in. Okay. I am in. Uh -huh. Are you able to answer that question? And we don't also use that. Eh? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have had it also for the first time. Okay. Yeah. So maybe maybe that is an area of more research uh, yeah. for the panelists so that next time. Okay, there is Helen Masharia who says EMDR is effective but requires specialized training. Okay. So it can be done, but it requires uh, specialized training. Okay, so those are the questions that I was able to see and a number of them have been answered by Wairimo. I don't know whether someone has a comment before uh, we end this uh, program. Anyone? Dr. If, you, if you allow me, Dr. Terry. Yes. Um, the, the, the main topic of this evening was trauma. Mm -hmm. But there was also the work-life balance. Mm -hmm. What is the nexus? Uh, I just wanted to throw some light and say that where that trauma happened should be isolated um, from the person. For example, we talked a lot about the, 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 the explosions, the, the, the terrorist attacks or things like fires in schools or domestic violence, anything that we can do to remove the, 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 the traumatized persons from where they work or live um, would help in that trauma uh, reducing. For example, in fires that happen in school, uh, you have seen that like, like in Garissa, um, Students were moved to other schools because that would help them overcome the traumatic experience. And they got to an environment where they would not be reminded from time to time uh, about the incident. If it is domestic violence, um, uh, families might uh, even consider moving out of there or occasionally going to places where they are not experiencing. So I wanted to, to show what is the connection between work-life balance and trauma. Trauma happens somewhere, and it is usually uh, at the place of work. For example, the one which just happened in Westlands, you remember? Following that route or going to the same buildings and offices keeps gives those people flashbacks of what happened. So a break from that uh, workplace uh, helps. Uh, I hope that point comes out clear. So there is a connection between work-life balance and, uh, and, and trauma. Okay, thank you, Justin, for that uh, input. I can see in, uh, we are almost coming to the closure of this session. Now we are, we'll be having regular uh, webinars. We are calling it the ha happy place, as we said in the beginning, that uh, there is a desire to have a, a happiness uh, commission, and therefore we can start with the, uh, these uh, webinars where we'll be handling different issues. And therefore, if you feel there is a topic that you'd like us to tackle in the next session, uh, kindly write it on the chat, then we'll be able uh, to uh, organize one. Although we still have various topics that are lined up for us uh, to share in this forum. So thank you for coming. Remember to subscribe to my yes, YouTube channel so that you can be having uh, notifications for wholesome content that we post. Yes, somebody was talking. Oh, Virginia yeah. Kigori, your hand is up and Flora. Okay, Virginia first. Yes, thank you, Dr. Rebecca. I'm actually so happy and I'm thankful for all the presenters. That was uh, beautiful and uh, really a lot of insight. I just wanted to ask uh, how, how exactly are we supposed to respond when maybe something has just happened, an accident or maybe a, a bomb blast attack. I mean, a, a, okay, a, an attack of, of such a kind. Exactly, maybe what am I, how am I supposed to respond to these people who are already in this, you know, just 
the trauma just on time uh, before maybe they're even taken to whatever else or before they, how am I supposed to handle them? Thank you. Okay. I think Wairimo, you can mention that. Is it related to PFA? Yes. Wairimo, uh -huh. you can unmute, yes? Yes, uh, uh, that is where psychological first aid comes in. If somebody has suffered trauma and you are the first person in touch with, the, with that person, you can be able to talk to them, to calm them down, if you are not able to talk to them for some reasons, you can get somebody who can offer assistance. If it's a case that should be taken to authority, you should be able to advise. If it's a child, you can be there for them. So there are so many ways you can, you can be able to help that person even before they get to the, to the help that, that they need. That is where psychological first aid comes in. And that is why I said that it can be offered by anybody. You do not need any training. The regular things you do when you find a child has fallen down on the road, just correcting that child and calming them down, that is psychological first aid. So anybody who is experiencing trauma, you can be able to do something. The person in touch with that person the first responder can be able to offer some assistance, be it guiding them on where to go to report, maybe removing them from danger, or just calming them down. It is possible. Okay. Thank you for that uh, feedback. Now we have Laura. I can, I can just add there, uh, Dr. Terry. Um, you, you are very present. You are very uh, arrival, especially if the traumatized can see that very view, that very presence of viewers um, helps in the person realizing that already help has started coming. And then the next thing is to remove what, where that person, where that has happened, uh, reduces the impact of trauma, call the ambulance. And because a trauma can last for some while, um, the flashbacks will be reduced by the fact that somebody arrived, somebody called an ambulance, and the, generally people are concerned about what has happened to you. It, it's very, very important for the first people who arrived there, even if they were not doctors, as Wairimu has said. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Flora, you have a question? Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr for giving me this opportunity. I'm, I'm, I'm joining you for the first time and I've really been, I've really gotten a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a person living with disability mm -hmm. and uh, we have a lot of issues, especially among the uh, parents having the children with living with disabilities. Personally, I, as, as I grew up, I suffered a lot of rejection, a lot of, uh, a lot of stigma, and, and it is stigma that has continued. It, is, it, is, it has been on for so many years, as long as I live with disability. Uh, we have issues with parents who suffer from, immediately they get a child with, with, uh, with disabilities, You'll, you'll discover that some, some of the parents will disappear and leave the children with, the, with one parent. Um, uh, what, 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 uh, what do you do? What, what, how, how would you help us? Help us because this is very rampant in our country, especially African nations, that uh, uh, um, disabilities associated with stigma, with, uh, Curses and uh, uh, and other 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 beliefs. How can we? How can you assist us? Because uh, many disability, uh, many disabled people suffer silently, and uh, I, I did not hear about when when I was listening to all the presenters. That area, I, I didn't see whether it was tucked. Yeah, those are the questions I was. Okay, thank you, Flora, for that question about uh, 
uh, people who are able differently nowadays, we don't call them disabled <laughs> because you are not disabled. There's something you can do. You also have your talent. So you are talented differently or able differently. Uh, I don't know whether Claude, you want to answer that one? You can unmute. All right. No, no. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rebecca. Uh, I'd like just to come uh, and then uh, give some uh, ideas to. Is my sister? I don't know. Uh, I forgot the name. What's her name again? Flora. 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 Thank you so much for coming there for, to us with that question. Uh, I think it's a quite a critical area where, as a counselor or all the professionals that you are here. We, we know that there are people naturally, they can be physically limited in uh, the way that it is, or either from accident or birth. But we need to understand that uh, the process there is about joining, as uh, Dr. Rebecca said, is not because you are limited on other things and then other area of your body or your mind cannot do positively and extensively. Now we need just to journey in a sense of accepting yourself as you are in the first place to accept yourself. I think the, the, the stigma is, is there in, in life. People, they can say anything, anyhow, even though you are not uh, physically limited, they can just say things about that. You need to understand the world is so, so cruel in a sense of way you must not give attention to those things that they are saying. I do understand that the stigma is not something that maybe you can avoid. As you say, that is still continuing to put you down in different ways, and especially in Africa, you are right by saying that, but we need to start rising above that by a sense of accepting that you are the way that you are naturally, God has done so, and there are scriptures in the Bible which say that other things is for the glory of God, if we can take it in that angle, if you're a Christian or maybe you're a believer, to accept what you are, because you are a gift to the world, you are a gift to your family, you are a gift to your community with different perspective of or different areas of your body or of your mind that you can do more than other people that are, are promoting that stigma around your, your personality or what you are as a person. Let me assure you that you are the way that God has created you. You are a message, you are a gift, and then you can do more than what is being limited by that stigma. What another, another point is just not to give your ears to that. Don't let that message to be internalized in you to undermine your personal because it's what you can listen can make yourself to start believing and not really concentrating on what you can deliver and what you are able to do as per God creation. That's what I want to bring to your attention. We love you so much and then you can do more then what stigma that is bringing to your attention. Okay, thank you, Dr. Claude, for that uh, input. I'm also aware, like in the education sector, there are policies in place to ensure that uh, children or people who are able differently uh, are working together with those that are different from them. So that one is there in the policy. Maybe with time, people will realize that there is need to change and need to... Uh, work or integrate or interact with people who are able differently uh, as much as possible. So I think that is happening only that uh, it has not really been implemented, but we have policies like in Kenya that en encourage people who are able differently or children or students to work together. We call it inclusive education, to work together with other uh, students in, in schools. Uh, I saw uh, Francis' hand up. I don't know what. Can I put a, just uh, uh, yeah. I I I I'll just mention quickly, doctor, because uh, there's a person who asked something about trauma, maybe in an attack, a terrorism attack, uh, and uh, I was not uh, wondering whether was was that person asking what they should do. Uh, or, uh, then, then there is also something that was related with uh, taking a person outside a trauma where it's taking place. Uh, I thought it's good to mention there are a couple of combined efforts involved here. 
you will need, uh, as I say, that you need a, a welfare officer. You need to, 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 to find out whether these people understand that, whether there are laws there that you can remove somebody from their family if they are suffering. And if there are no laws there, then you need to involve a lawyer. You need to involve a police officer. So, so there are a lot of combined uh, forces that need to work together uh, to change the environment of that person. It cannot happen like that, just going and taking somebody from where the trauma is taking place, just for information. Then if, if, if it, it's something involving a bombing, uh, there are also a lot of logistics here, which, which, which involve situational analysis. What should I do when there is a bombing? What should I do when somebody has been eaten by a car? Should I, what do I need to do quickly? So, so it, it depends with the situation and whom can you call quickly? So, so I, I thought just to mention that uh, anything like that, uh, either involving a danger of one person or a collective danger, like the bombing, which happened in a Nairobi embassy, uh, American embassy in Nairobi, I think there are a couple of things that we, you, you can think quickly, but, but your safety also, if, if something is happening, bombing is happening and you're there, the first thing is your safety. Don't run where the attackers are coming from. So, so, so be careful, it's good to be sober. So that, like the Gariza, the Gariza shooting, where students were running aimlessly. As they were running, they were fighting the gunmen. The gunman was just facing them. As they ran, he will hit them. So it's very important, I think, uh, 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 people uh, quickly again about disability. I remember when I was in Kenya, we had uh, a campaign to educate families about the place of uh, gifted, able gifted children within a family. Because in most cases, I, I do not know whether the, the laws really in Kenya work, especially for different gifted uh, persons. I know institutions like schools, there are policies, but what about the government? Do the government really has laws that help to educate families uh, to bring a person from the back of the room here in the UK, I think Claude would agree. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah, are yeah, yeah. there are laws. Yeah, there are laws. There, yeah. there are laws. For example, when we came, the first thing, the first time we arrived in UK in our house in these and race because we are registered here, somebody had to go from house to house finding out who lives there, and you list the names of the people who lives there. So if you have a special child, then definitely you will find somebody coming to knock the door. So let's, let's, let, let's agree where the facts are. Kenyan's law, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure, I know we have somebody from the government here. I, I really question how robust they are. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. please let me come in there because I've, I've been in government, both, both national and, uh, and county governments and the laws are there. Excuse and as me, you say you. correctly, is is there. Yeah. Uh, please, uh, we need to see your, 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 face nicely. I, I don't know. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, sorry. Okay. Is that better? Now you have put your video out off. <laughs> I don't know how, but and how about just that? Continue. Just continue. But how about that? I was just saying the, the laws are there. It is the extent to which they are implemented and they are improving by the day. Um, and, and very many things are being done for people living with disability than were being done before. For example, in employment, they are given handicaps. Before he or she even sits on a, a, an interview, he has given a number of points, score ahead of, ahead of the others. They are given personal assistance. And you know that these days when you bring up in a building, you have to, to, to bring it to provide for, for, for the ability of the person to, to, to go up the stairs and things like those. Every dis disability, I'm not sure whether this is scientific, is compensated by an, an ability. And what the, the Flora, I think she was, needs to do, if she hasn't already done it, is to identify what, what ability has compensated what she lacks. You have seen people with no hands at all. They use their legs to wash, to write, to sew, to do things. So there is, and, and one of the, I think one of the bishops has just said that God cannot create person who will not glorify 
his name. So I am without one, with one, one hand, but where has that uh, disability gone to? It has gone to the other or something like that. So it is there. And we also need to be very encouraging those people who, are, who have a shortfall in, 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 in abilities. So Flora, be encouraged, identify what you can do. We are there. I'm a very strong supporter of the disabled people. In fact, I won a prize when I was in the county of Kembu for upholding the welfare of the disabled. Okay, thank you, Justin, for that clarification. Yes, I'm aware there are policies and there are rules, not only in schools or educational institutions, but uh, elsewhere in Kenya, we have uh, such laws. And we also are aware that there are other people in this forum from other countries, and I'm sure that is also taken care of. The only issue is implementing them, and therefore we need to continue with advocacy uh, for people who are talented differently or they are able dif differently. Now, there is another question. I think uh, uh, maybe Irimo can answer Rebecca, this. Rebecca, Dr. Dr. Wambua. Yes, Zabli, Hello? yes. Yeah. I, I wanted um, uh, to say this uh, uh, to Flora. I, I, in case um, uh, the stigma that she's experiencing is causing her uh, psychological trauma, and she would like to be psychologically supported, we have a number of uh, uh, organizations in the country uh, that she can get in touch with and uh, get that psychological support. Uh, uh, even the National Council for Persons Living with Disabilities. In fact, what, that should be the first whatever organization that uh, she needs to get in touch with. They'll um, uh, facilitate uh, uh, that psychological support uh, for her. Okay. Yeah, I think that is uh, very good information. Thank you. Okay. I hope, Laura, you are helped. Eh? I'm, 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 I'm helped. Okay. But my concern also, my concern also is, uh, I, I, I also mentioned about, uh, remember we have so many uh, persons with disabilities that are in the villages that have not been reached, mm -hmm. but parents don't know what to do with them. Mm. And some of them have been hidden, they are not exposed. Those are, and, the, and they are the majority. Yeah, and some of us, had an opportunity, a few, very few of us had an opportunity mm. to go to school. That's why I'm able to, to join you and uh, listen. Thank mm. you for those encouragements. Mm. Uh, uh, but again, you've said about the policies in the government. We have so, ma so, ma so many policies that are in place, but they have not been implemented. We mm -hmm. still suffer from stigma, especially those who are trying to look for employment and all sorts of uh, sort of employment. Those are some of the things that we still suffer from because I'm personally living with a disability or they, I'm able differently. So mm -hmm. I, I, I understand what we go through because we've experienced, I've experienced this, this, uh, these stigmas, this, uh, so I don't know. Our organization, this organization that you are, we are running, you are running, Daktari, mm -hmm. is there a way that we can help, uh, we can help us to be able to reach the government so that these policies can be, can be implemented fully. The 5% that needs to, to, be, to be followed uh, to, in, in employment. I mean, yeah, those are some of the things that we suffer silently because maybe we are not in a position to really talk it out and say, this is what we are going through. And um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, Flora, we hear you. I, and I think uh, the topic on people able differently, I think can be uh, another topic of discussion. But like you're saying, the government should be pushed to do more than it is doing because policies are there, but uh, we are aware, and we see it on, on national TV or on media, where children who are able differently are mistreated by their parents, locked up, and, and so on. So uh, we have one person from the Ministry of Health. I'm sure she's going to link, link us with the necessary people or the relevant people uh, so that this issue can be addressed. Like you're saying, it is urgent and it, it is serious. So. We can say that is to be continued. 
uh, for now. We may not exhaust that topic on uh, people able differently. Now, finally, uh, someone is asking, do we have public resources on trauma? Uh, maybe Wairimo can answer that. Do we have public resources on trauma? Or where are they? Can you give us some links maybe so that uh, after this we can study a bit more? Uh, because we realize the session today was more of uh, introductory. So people need more training and also they need uh, more resources to uh, refer to. Uh, Dr. Rebecca, we do not have public resources on trauma. Mm -hmm. What usually happens is that whenever there is a disaster or maybe something uh, which is causing trauma, organizations such as Red Cross, AMREF, they move in and other NGOs and even individuals. But for the government, there is the disaster management, um, uh, Department of Disaster Management it deals with, that one deals with the large scale uh, disasters. But when there, need, there is need to mobilize resources, it also does that. In case the resources they have is not, are not enough, they are able to mobilize. So we have the disaster management department. It is in place. It is only that I think they are seen when there is a, you know, there is a large calamity. But uh, for, 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 individual, for individuals, anybody who is experiencing trauma, depending on what it is all about, there are policemen in every locality, there are chiefs in every locality, there is a children's office in every locality, and there is also, there are quite a number of government offices where somebody can go, and get assisted. I think uh, um, I have answered that. Okay. And uh, just to add, I think we have massive open online courses. When you search uh, through Google, maybe you, you type trauma or notes on trauma, then you put PDF, you are, you are able to get a, a lot of information. So even as we seek more information from the government, we can also search online and you'll have a lot of information on trauma. As we said, uh, this subject may not be exhausted today. It is more of an introduction uh, and we look forward to more. And in case maybe you have an organization require training in these areas that we've been discussing, then feel free and get in touch with me. I'll write my contact there. Then we, we can organize for more training because today, we realize that uh, we are not able to exhaust the topics as much as you would like. Uh, I'm seeing Faith saying government under the Department of Special Program has been pushing for inclusion on persons with disabilities. It will be good to check what is happening. Somebody else also says, I saw, I also saw a guideline by Ministry of Education on disability assessment. So, I think they, we still have the information out there. So let's be a, a bit patient as we research online and I'm sure we'll be, we'll be helped. So I don't know whether as we wind up, you can write the next topic of discussion according to what you think or according to the experience we've had today. I don't know whether you have specific topics. The one on disability has come up and I'm sure we'll be able to uh, interrogate that topic uh, later in another webinar. My name, my name, uh, a quick suggestion. Eh? Yes, Francis. Can I suggest some of these discussions like today's forum? Mm -hmm. If somebody can do a skimming of uh, the important notes, you could uh, negotiate and uh, maybe even have them published and perhaps also talk with some of the medias. A small forum which is able to raise campaign and maybe call attention from these ministries. And, and I'm very sure that's how things go. Others will be discussing these and uh, power them as part of research because research is supposed to and raise a problem in a society. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a suggestion that I have. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for that. Yes, we'll be able to continue with this conversation. 
Uh, somebody is asking, do we have practitioners who are trained in sign language? Yes, we do. Maybe you're suggesting next time we should have a sign language interpreter that can be organized next time. Otherwise, uh, we thank you for coming. Thank you for gracing this occasion. And we thank you for your participation. Uh, somebody is saying, I was wondering about professional public resources, not sure of chiefs, policemen have been trained to deal with trauma. Okay, so I think you're just saying uh, we need more training on trauma. And just like we said the other time, we need more training on mental health issues. Uh, therefore, we have a representative from the government, but we can also reach the government and look for ways of ensuring that these topics are maybe information about these topics are disseminated throughout the country and also beyond Kenya, because we have participants from outside Kenya. I think uh, our discussion has been uh, fulfilling and Okay, somebody is saying I am a sign language interpreter. I can support. All right. So if you are sign, I can give can my I, I have I have a second. <laughs> I have okay. a second to, to, to thank our friends, one from uh, University of Nairobi, Kageni, and uh, Glory from Mombasa. Please on your, your behalf for, for inviting them and they are here. Oh, okay. Yeah. So are they Thank in so just to say Jambo? Yes, Lisbeth, you want to say something as we wind up? No, I was just appreciating. Uh, this, this was so helpful. Mm -hmm. I work with the university students and we are doing research on mental health and it's such a big issue among the university students. Mm -hmm. Failure to perform well. Failure to do well to manage relationships. You know, this is the time they are trying to get relationships. And uh, issues of substance abuse is bringing a lot of anxiety in the, among the university students. And uh, we are trying to see, uh, this was very helpful for me because we are trying to see whether you can get a quorum to help us speak to these students. Okay. There are some of the hard courses like engineering, medicine are bringing them down when they fail. With the, to perform well as they expected. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you for so, that. So, and somebody else asked me a question, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. A student asked, uh, what, what do you do to a student who has been uh, sexually violated in terms of mental health, mental well-being, when, when some, a student has been sexually violated? Okay. Yeah. Uh, who wants to answer Zablon, you want to answer that? Uh, uh, we may not be able to answer some of the questions forever in this forum. Eh? Uh, if someone has an issue, uh, let them seek uh, professional help. Uh, there is help. Uh, yeah. the, the university can refer them uh, to uh, think Kenyatta National Hospital. Uh, we have uh, uh, the, other, the other hospital, uh, Madare National Teaching, uh, Referral and Teaching Hospital. Uh, they have uh, professionals who can assist with that student. There is help. Okay. Yeah, sure. All right. So I think you can also read the comments that are on the chat. So I think we come to the end. Somebody is asking for the link. Uh, this session has been recorded and therefore we'll, we'll be able to post the recording. Uh, on my YouTube channel, Dr. Rebecca Wambua, you can check there and also subscribe so that we'll be able to get uh, notifications when new, new, new information or new content has been posted. So we thank you uh, for participating in this webinar and therefore I'm going to request one of us to pray as we end the meeting. Reverend Francis, maybe you can lead us in a word of prayer. You can unmute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's okay. pray. <clears throat> Loving God, we want to thank you so much uh, for Queen Elizabeth II, oh God, you called home. And we thank you for Charles the Fund, 
taking over as a king. We thank you for this forum from all corners of our country in Kenya, those who went to sacrifice their precious time to be here to engage and to share out uh, works that they have done on research over a long period of time. We thank you for these gifts, working in governments, in our institutions, and they are here, Lord, sharing these wonderful ideas on how we can work together from different sectors to ensure our society is mentally health and mentally free from all traumas. We thank you for our coordinator, Dr. Rebecca Omambua, and we pray for strength upon her and those support team she is working with to ensure that this technology works from Moi University, Masida Moliro University. And we thank you for others who, who are here today, Dr. Cloud, I know very busy schedule. And all those who joined today, because I saw 108 in number who joins us. And we thank you, God, for them. We look forward for another beautiful day to engage again, as the English people tells us, an iron sharpened an iron. May we sharpen each other for a better society. For we bring these prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. May now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Amen. The love of God. Love of God. And, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Be with us, Be with us now. now. Forever. Forever. Amen. 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 Peace of God. Amen.